It is a gigantic undertaking. To give you some idea of the scale of it all, each of Drax's 12 cooling towers is taller than St Paul's Cathedral. The River Ouse kindly supplies three tonnes of water each day for the cooling process. And it was the river that played a crucial part in one of Selby's most colourful legends. It involves monk Benedict of Auxerre, who in the year 1069 had a vision of a place where one day a great abbey would stand. Years later, he was sailing up the River Ouse when suddenly three swans settled on the water. And Benedict recognised the area as the one he'd seen in his vision. He planted a cross and he staked his claim. Selby Abbey survived the dissolution of the monasteries and the odd natural disaster and contains some fabulous stained glass. The most famous feature is the 14th century Washington window. John de Washington was a prior in the region. He shared a family tree with the father of the new world, George Washington. The family crest of stars and stripes shown in the window also served as the basis for the American flag. Selby was heavily involved in the English Civil War. There was the Battle of Selby in 1644 when Lord Fairfax stormed the town and recaptured it from the Royalists. But 700 years before that, it became the home of the Archbishops of York. This gatehouse, now owned by the Landmark Trust, is all that remains of the great palace at Caywood. King John and Henry VIII were guests here in their time, and it was here in 1530 that Cardinal Wolsey was lying sick when they came and arrested him for treason. He was a popular man in these parts. It's said that as he was led away, there was not a dry eye in the house. It's an event that's been enshrined in legend and song. And all the king's horses and all the king's men never, ever did restore Wolsey again. And so to the show. Our Academy of Experts is installed at the Abbey Leisure Centre, hoping fervently there'll be no falls or breakages. Let's see what the people of Selby have brought us. Quite a lot by the look of it. Look, that's the queen. Do have this other one? Yeah, trying to put this with it. But that's the first time she's been in the back of a car. A whiskey flask. In the olden days, I was nip a whiskey on the keep you going, yeah. Well, that's it. That kept the deer safe. I'm sure nobody, <laughs> nobody could fire a decent shot after that. Um, we'll get some things taken in. It really is a socking great pedestal, isn't it? It's very heavy. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. All walnut on here, because it's a solid walnut baluster there, which I think is really nice. And this, this frame here, all very gently sort of scalloped all the way around. I like that, too. It gives the, the, the top of the table really quite a lot of weight, doesn't it? Yeah. Now, I'm going to uh, go underneath here, because this is a tilt-top table. Let's see if I can do this. I might need some help. That sounds good. Here we go. Now, that is pretty spectacular, I think. Can you tell me anything about this, or where it's come from, or...? Well, I got it from a father, and it was given to him by his mother, and um, it belonged to her auntie and uncle. Now, I believe... My grandma's uncle was a mace bearer of Pontefract, oh. and I'm given to understand that it came from the Lord Mace Parlour. Good gracious, so it might well have a, a very grand provenance then. Y yeah, I think it came into my uncle's possession about 60 years ago. Right. Well, the date of the table would go back quite a long way yes. further than that, and the, the style of the base and the, the, the really incredibly decorative character of the front would suggest uh, the third quarter, say, of the of the 19th century. So it's still showing quite a lot of French influence, and the, the, the French style was very popular at, at right. that time. Walnut veneer as a ground, into which are set all these different shapes and cartouches. And I think that, I mean, the middle bit's almost too cute, isn't it, really? <laughs> <laughs> these musical trophies that you've got there and here, really lovely violin there, and the tambourine and the, the horn, and so four musical trophies, and then interspersed with flower sprays. Fantastic colour in this yes. table, isn't there? Yeah. It's kept its, its greens. There is a problem with the surface of this table. Uh, yes. We stripped the polish off about seven or eight years ago. Why? Um, because our eldest daughter, who was three at the time, uh, decided to colour on it with a felted pen. Oh. And in order to remove the colour, we removed the polish. Right. And we've never had it redone. 
Right. Well, no, I mean, it's a shame because mm. I mean, there, are, there are little bits of polish left and you can see the richness. It really would be worth having that properly polished again. Well, I, th I think you ought to consider uh, an insurance valuation of around £6,000 because okay. if something happened to it, you wouldn't forgive yourself. No. <laughs> she's lost her earrings and she's lost the top of her crown. But I think if she was washed up, even with those defects, she'd probably be worth about £150, probably a little more. Oh, yes. Uh, now, this object here is rather interesting, isn't it? Uh, we've got a little stoneware thing. And do you know what this is? Well, uh, I think it's uh, hand warming. Yes, bottle. yes. And, uh, and, and a hot water bottle you could put in bed. Yes, yes. And it was made. You can see there's a registration mark here. And that was registered in 1929. Oh, yes. And you acquired this from another relative? That was from another relative, yes. Yeah, yeah. But you've done very well from your relative. Yes, it's yeah. not very valuable, um, 80 to 100 pounds, perhaps yeah. a little more, but it's, it's a good, interesting piece. Yeah. And then this big, uh, what I suppose we can rather poshly call a jardinier <laughs> in Yorkshire, I think you'd call it an aspidestra pot, wouldn't you? That's it, yes. <laughs> well, it's, it's a very well-known piece. It's made by the Minton firm, um, probably around about 1868-1870, and typical of what's called Majolica. Majolica introduced by Minton uh, as a result of experiments by a Frenchman, uh, Léon Arnoux, who was their art director. Yes. And uh, he had this way of making these opaque colours to decorate what's really basically a, a terracotta pot. You've got something which is, is well-known, uh, and very collectible, really. Unfortunately, it's got a little chip. You can see, yes, if we does. turn it round here, yes. you can see the little chip there. Yeah. Um, but otherwise, it's in pretty good condition, and they're extremely fashionable in America. I would think in the region of £2,000, probably a little more. Really? Yeah. So, of the, of the items we've picked out from all those you brought today, uh, I found these extremely interesting. So, yes. thank you very much for bringing yes, them today. Thank you. Very thank much. you. Every so often you get a rare treat on the roadshow, and this is one of my rare treats, because I've never seen uh, a brass kettle on stand of exactly this form. Where did you get it from? Well, I inherited it from my father's family, who were very local and were farmers in the area. My grandmother said that it was used as the... Um, at the Sunday school teas. I think it dates from about 1820. It's got the original turned ebony handle on the top of the kettle, which matches the turned ebony on the stand. Um, if you turn it up inside, you've got a tinned interior, which is what you should have. And the really rare thing is having this stand, which although it looks black, is made of brass too. I didn't know that the stand was made of brass. I always assumed it was iron. Or... No, if you look carefully, particularly up at this top end, you can see the, the original brass underneath this black patination, yes. and all this heat in the fireplace, standing in the ashes, is what has made it go completely black. And inside, this wonderful pig of iron. So for your family's Sunday school teas, that would have been in the fire and would have gone into this stand, would have radiated the heat into the bottom of the kettle, and it's all remained exactly as it was in those days. Yes. Well, in my living memory, it's never been used. And I've never cleaned the back of this kettle because I think if you do clean old brass, you're losing part of its history. I think this colour remaining on the original stand is very attractive. Now, a, a, a kettle like this ordinarily would perhaps be worth 100 to 150 pounds. To have the kettle on the stand from this period translates it rather excitingly into an object that's worth perhaps six to 800 pounds. Mm. That's that, the difference by keeping it all together. It's wonderful. Yes, that's rather a surprise, really. We've got here, of course, a small collection of absolutely the typical type of watches that turn up every road show. The problem is, of course, that everybody had a granny and a grandpa, and most of them have got the watches, and so, although they're marvellous pieces, pieces of work, this little one here is a typical granny watch, some 1900. Beautifully engraved, probably still working immaculately, but 50 pounds or less. 
So this is a very, as you said, very handsome collection. With some of these, to my innocent eye, look terribly expensive. What would you advise people to do, bringing in their watches, to avoid disappointment? Well, it's difficult, really, to say, because there isn't, of course, an easy way of looking on the bottom and saying, uh, it's marked like this, so therefore it's 50 pounds or 100 pounds. I'm afraid one just has to have, bring them along and we have to have a look, because there's always that chance there's going to be something inside that's going to make it valuable. There's always that chance. <laughs> Well. Oh, very nice. Can I give it a yes. hit? Oh. Nice one. It's been passed down the family on my husband's side from his great aunt. Um, it is the lady in the picture there. It did originally belong to her five-year-old sister which she got it for the Christmas present, which unfortunately, six weeks later, she died of diphtheria. And apparently, when she was, this was the last thing she was holding with a doll when oh. she died. Is so, that, um, eldest it? sisters kept yes. it in memory to um, her sister. Was that an orange, do you yeah. think? Yeah. Well, it's a tragic story, mm. and as I always say, the things that are more valuable are the ones that haven't been played with and usually yeah. it's because of a sad story like this she's been put away in her original box in superb pristine condition and the fact that it's a british doll because we don't have very many british dolls in this country she's what we call a shoulder head so she's all in one with a shoulder plate mm -hmm. lovely original silk satin dress and little overcoat original shoes her own little bag and this photograph of the original owner all go to push up her value to I would say somewhere in the region of two to three hundred possibly a little bit more so okay well this is really psychedelia isn't it fantastic bit of optical art but um, from when not from the flower power age of the 1960s but Look at that one. That's fantastic, too. This is, if you like, psychedelia from a century before that. These are 19th century kaleidoscopic slides. And there's another rather fun one here of somebody looking in the mirror, and they see <laughs> the donkey's face instead of their own. Now, these slides obviously go with something much more extravagant this wonderful magic lantern how far can you trace it back yourself belonged to the wife's uncle they shown it when they were little like so his his job was as a as a no, projectionist was it no, i wanted were a plumber very good this particular magic lantern is a very good quality one it's um good mahogany body brass fittings and on the front here is the name of the manufacturer the hughes company was working from the 1870s um, all the way through until the early part of the uh, 20th century. There are two distinct parts to this. One is the, the lantern itself. I would say we're talking about perhaps 400 to 600 pounds, that sort of figure. And then we come to the slides. I would have said that we've probably got about 300 pounds, perhaps 350 pounds worth of slides. So put it all together, and on a good day, um, it could be just edging up towards a thousand pounds. The marks on this year are, are jolly confusing because it's stamped there Nevada silver. Yeah. Now, there's actually not a gram of silver in this. It was actually a manufacturer in Sheffield in the 19th century who was literally stamping all these names on. I mean, today, there's no way they'd allow you to actually put that on because of course it would be Legal. so exactly trades descriptions act you know, it's made all the more confusing by these marks at the end because they, those give you of course the visual impression of a set of hallmarks oh, right. but they're not when you actually look at them in detail they're quite spurious and they're just made to give you that idea of a set of hallmarks so the whole thing really is set out to confuse it's a fraud <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. In a nutshell, I think you've got the fact. In 1906, Selby Abbey was destroyed by fire, and one of the stonemasons at that period in time retained so much wood from the abbey 
and over the next 10 or 15 years, we used it for carving walking sticks for special people. Ah, you had to be important to get yeah, one, did you? That's right, yes. This one is an earlier one, which he carved for one of his workmates, but this belongs to Selby Abbey, from their archives. This is a later model, probably around 1920. But both made from wood the from timbers, the timbers? from the old abbey, and they're marked on Old Oak, 1069, Selby Abbey. 1069. Wonderful Before things. we were born. And how many, <laughs> how many, how many of these are there? Probably 12. In the world. That's it. Yeah. It's mounted in a very pretty platinum case that's probably French, but the value of the watch is more or less commensurate with the diamonds and the metalwork. So it's probably worth in auction um, something in the region of 400 pounds. Now, um, what we've got here is something else. We have a compact. Yes. It was given to me fairly recently by, better not say, an elderly lady, a mature mm. lady, and, and she'd inherited it from an, an even older lady that had died, and, um, and she gave it to me, I think, for safekeeping. Well, this jet black like this is quite severe looking, but it's very typical of the 1930s. Mm. Let's have a look inside. Inside, you've got the mirror, yeah. and then you've got these two little doors, rather like wardrobe doors. Mm -hmm. And as the lid flips up, it sort of slightly releases the uh, handles of these really doors. Dinky. And you can see it's a powder compact. Mm -hmm. um, inside there, you've got a little hallmark. Yes. And it's not gold, it looks like gold, but it's actually silver gilt. Oh, right. And it's black enamel on the surface. So mm -hmm. if I turn it round like that, you can see the full extent the way that it has been black enameled. Lovely diamonds that form this flash on do, the front. Do you think those are initials? I think they probably were. And if you think about the 1930s, it was fashionable to put a monogram of some description in a very linear look. There's a tiny inscription well, there I, I didn't on the see edge. It, but my daughter saw it, and, and there's a number. That's right, because it's by Cartier, yes. London. Mm. And if you look in the hallmark, it's 1934 and that makes it quite valuable, oh. I'm pleased to say. Now, it ought to be worth something approaching a thousand pounds. Really? Yes. <laughs> oh, well, I was going to keep my pills in it. You still, well, you still well, can. I still might, <laughs> on special occasions. Well, it's entirely appropriate that as we're here in Yorkshire today, we should be looking at this wonderful piece of embroidery which depicts archery because of the important association that Yorkshire as a county has had with the development and history of archery. Now, this sampler, we can see, was worked by Sarah Ensom, who finished this work in her 11th year, 1802. So she would have done this just at the beginning of the major part of the Napoleonic Wars. And if we start from the top of it, there's this wonderful scene of an archery match. And you can see two gentlemen there. One of them has just loosed his arrow, and it's done in this beautifully naive style, and there's a great arrow winging its way towards the butts. And the two chaps standing next to it presumably are the scorers. Mm. I think they're probably quite brave fellows to, to stand there. <laughs> One thing that is very important about the whole aspect of archery is that it was the first sport in which both men and women could compete virtually equally in an outdoor form of sport. Yes. And there we have a lady, very, very fashionably attired. The detail is absolutely beautiful. She's a really has observed things, worked them in, and I think she's been inspired by them. My favourite bit of the whole picture is this person arriving yes. for church service at the yes. sedan chair. It's now that's got to be style, hasn't yes, it? Yes, that's wonderful. Yes, I love that. You get lots of formal painting of people standing there with their bow and arrow being painted by the leading artists yeah. of the day, but there's very little of this sort of folk art that I've ever seen. And yet, archery was so important in the history of Yorkshire, and, the, and there's a match now that's still known as the York Round, which is still shot, so it's, it's absolutely wonderful that, that we've got it here today. And in beautiful condition, with very little fading, and just the, the odd little hole in it. I paid for that and another sampler, which you, a friend of yours, had, and I paid a thousand for the two. Well, I think it was a good buy because I think that this is worth about £1,500 because of its clarity and its unusual subject as well. How did you come by it? Through your family? Inheritance or did you buy it? It was a gift. 
a gift. Mm -hmm. It's a fabulous gift to have, I must say. You know it's Japanese, obviously. I, I presume they're Japanese, yes. And, and what do you think he is with his sword here? Um, a samurai. Well, yes, but in fact, it's a little bit more than that. It's a bit more complicated than that. In fact, he's a sort of renegade samurai warrior. He's called a Yamabushi. And the Yamabushi were priest samurai figures. Was he, was he like a, a bad warrior? Yes, he would. Yes, he would have been. That he is a sort of renegade character who left the, the official samurai clan uh, for whatever reasons, went into the mountains, and became a priest samurai. But he didn't turn out to be a particularly good figure. In fact, he was a renegade character, and they would then descend from the the heights of the, the mountains around Kyoto and descend into Kyoto and cause absolute havoc. So they're not at all popular, actually. Um, this particular figure is by uh, one of the most well-known of the Japanese uh, bronze makers. I, I take this off here, which is a sort of travelling box here, and let's take his conch shell off. Now, this conch shell, you can see he's blowing it by his rounded cheeks. I suppose, is it a sort of um, mobile telephone of its day? So he would have been calling his companions, you know, from the mountaintops. Or to announce the arrival. Or to announce the arrival, indeed. But this particular piece has a signature at the back, here, and he's by quite a well-known maker called Miao, who is the most well-known of the Japanese bronze makers. This, of course, was post-1868, when the habit of wearing swords was, uh, was forbidden, and people turned to Western dress, and thus all the metal workers turned their hands to making animals and bronze figures. But some are extremely fine, and they can be large, and the large Miao ones, which are of wonderful quality, are worth tens of thousands of pounds. And this particular one, it's not really of that calibre be worth a minimum of something like 1500 but probably more like two to three thousand pounds so i hope that's a good surprise yeah, lovely good that's amazing. that one's dopey and this one looks he looks a bit bashful yeah that's yes i think he's bashful oh no he's not actually look he's grumpy grumpy he's grumpy so maybe this one is um he's bashful yes. he's bashful very good well You've got a, these are, these are a lovely group of Snow White and Seven Dwarfs, and where did you get them from? I think like since, since I was young. And, and how old were you when you started? About two. Very good. Can you see on the bottom here, there's a name which says Wade, and um, it's been cast out of um, pottery and then it's been painted on afterwards so this this paint is a little bit fragile you can see um, on places that it's, it's chipped it is a bit chipped yeah but um, no it's it's a nice early set dating from um, probably the 1930s I think it's actually worth a lot of money it could be worth about perhaps 500 pounds it's all right isn't it I understand that it was done by a private in the regiment of Captain Oates after the Scot of the Antarctic where he went out into the snow to die and it was done with army and um, darning wool. Because it looks very coarse wool work. Yes. And if yeah. it was done with army sock darning mm. wool, well that makes it kind of triply interesting in a way. And here we have a gallant gentleman the absolute emotional epitaph here. It's, it's very beautifully done. It survived in jolly good condition. That's right, yeah. Um, I think it's a really super object, and it would be incredibly popular were it ever to be sold. Really? Mm -hmm. If this comes onto the market, I think you'd be likely to get between 1,000 and 1,500 pounds. Really? Mm -hmm. Good heavens. It's a very rare object. That's wonderful. Thank you very much for bringing it in. Thank you. This was presented to my great-grandfather as a wedding present, and he was a barrister, so I suppose the connection's quite apt when you think of the history. Well, the title, Laying Down the Law, yes. or Trial by Jury, is yes. the other title. Well, it's one of the most famous images by Lancia, yes. one of the greatest painters, animal painters in the 19th century. At that time, Judicial reform was very, very topical, and the artist was trying to give us a message here. It was a satiring the very fact that uh, possibly animals and dogs could do a better job than their human counterparts. Yes, yes. Yes, I, I do understand that Lancia saw the dog sitting at the table and said it reminded him of a judge. Well, I think we'd better say now, of course, that it's not the original. Oh, yes, yes. But it's a very, very good version of the picture. Now, it was 
either purchased or commissioned by the Duke, to De the Duke of Devonshire, wasn't it? And it was painted about 1840. Yes, that's right. Yes. yes. This dog here, this spaniel, was in fact the Duke of Devonshire's dog. Yes. It was engraved in 1841-42, and in the engraving, he doesn't appear, and in yes. fact the dog was actually painted in later. Yes, so I understand. Artists really magnified their income by having the paintings engraved and setting the engravings all over the country. Look at this wonderful poodle. The poodle belonged to Count Dorsey, and um, I think he's the most wonderful imposing figure. With a copy, and it's a very good copy, I think probably you ought to say 2,000 to 3,000 pounds and yes. chored for a bit more. Yes, right. Thank you. Some of them are of incredible rarity. Wonderful things. That's a terribly rare one. That, that's this little chap here on the front. It's a Worcester one. A lot of them are incredibly rare. Oh, I feel Worcester one. There's one or two that are probably a little bit wrong. Um, that dated 1790 is, is wrong. It's a later French piece. They often put phony dates on them. And this one, this is a Dutch decorated one. Yeah. That, that's here on the table, isn't it? They belong, in fact, to the, to the lodge. Not, not to us personally. No, we're, we're just the two who brought them along today for you to have a look, have a look at. at. And they, how do they come into being? I mean, have well, people they, given they, them? Yes, they, they were all donated principally by two members of the lodge who were quite wealthy and knowledgeable about this. This, this, is, this is extraordinary. This, this is a Worcester one. Yes. Um, terribly rare with the Freemasons on the front and um, the emblems as well engraved by James Ross, uh, right. who was a great Worcester engraver, uh, a pupil of Hancock, the great originator of transfer printing. And um, this, this is marvellous, about 1780, something yeah. like that, this yes. mug. I, I mean, some of these, I mean, this super lead spot, I mean, must be, I don't know, 1,500, 2,000 pounds. Really? Yes. This, this little Worcester mug is, is splendid. I, I mean, here we're 1,500, 2,000. Yes. Uh, some of the glass, especially these lemon squeezer bases, yes. uh, yeah. are worth up to a couple of thousand each. Gosh. So, I, I mean, on this table, heavens alone, just these few pieces from the collection, yes. there must be, what, 17, 18,000 pounds or more. Mm -hmm. and, and the collection. Oh, yeah. I, I've had a, just a little flipsy through this collection. It, it's mind-bending, it, yes, and, and one see, must be looking at something like around about a, a quarter of a million or more. Yeah. Take great steps to get them all itemized yeah. and all insured, yes. and, and perhaps enable the public to come and see it one day. Well, they, they, they can. We, we would welcome people to take an interest. Well, that's wonderful to know. Right. Thank you so very, very well, much. Thank, thank you, you very much, time. Mr. Sandon. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Yeah. <laughs> well, that it just proves that it's got a good tone. Yeah, yes. Um, and what we're looking at is a cornopian. Oh, yes. Because at the date that this was made, uh, that is between about 1830 and 1860, they weren't called cornets, they were called cornopians. I know very little about it, actually. Mm. Only that it's possibly, uh, or most likely, been handed down through the family. Uh, and possibly played uh, years and years ago by my uh, wife's grandfather in a Salvation Army oh, band. Oh, it really was in a Salvation oh, yes, Army oh, band. Yes, oh, yes, Oh, very good. Yes. Firstly, it's very attractive. I yes. love all this sort of curly cues yes, around yes, here. Yes, yes. And the next thing is, you look a bit closer and you say, hey, there's something a bit dodgy with the valves. The invention of valves to, uh, to get the notes only came in in the 1820s. Mm. And in 1838, a man called Shaw yes. invented this particular... System, yes. His, his system, yeah. which must have worked very well because, um, although finally it's died out now, yes. um, it was actually used for many, many years. Now, have you played both types? Played both types, And, yes. and what do yes. you, what's the difference? How, how do you find this? Well, this is a much smaller movement than the piston movement, the valve movement now. 
right. much, much slower. That's interesting. Yes, so yes. probably that then decided the future of the shore system. There, there's something that I love about it, mm -hmm. which is that you haven't cleaned it. No, I was going to ask you about that, actually. I mean, there are two schools of thought there, and particularly with uh, an instrument that's used perhaps in public performances, mm. people like to think that, um, you know, a brass wind should be shiny. Should and, and clean, but, that's right, yes. But to me, um, I know I bang on about this all the mm. time, something mm. that's old, I think, should look it, and it's got yes. this wonderful patina through yes. here, yes. this yes. golden colouring, right, which, yes. which lightens yes. the grey, and I think it's it's wonderful to see. Ooh, Here yes. we have the maker, Cola, yes. uh, of Henrietta Street. Here it is again right, yes. in London. Yes. Um, obviously of German yes. extraction. Yes. Yeah. The instrument itself is a rarity, mm. and um, cornopians are very desirable. If one was talking about auction value today, we'd be thinking about perhaps between 1,000 and 1,500 pounds. Really? Yeah. Yes, yeah. quite a surprise. Had you had its case, yes that might have pushed it over 2,000 pounds. Really? Yes. So that yes. does make an enormous yes. difference. Yes. But as it is, it's a wonderful instrument. Yeah, it is, it is. And go on using it. I've not seen anything like that before. It's, <laughs> it's extraordinary, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, well, it? well uh, to tell you the real thing is that generally, if you brought me a bit of soul now, I would say, gosh, that's grotesque and not very nice. Yeah. And they made these very complex, slightly um, Turkish-inspired piece. And this one, to my mind, is about the only bit of Sholna I've ever seen that works. I think, right. I think the painting is simply lovely. I think that's beautiful. Is it hand painted? Hand painted. Very well. It's a sort of fiancé material. Mm -hmm. These colours, typical of 1875 to 1890. Really? I suppose it's probably worth about six or seven hundred pounds. But I haven't seen anything really? of this quality. Did you know anything about this before? No, not at all. No, I've always liked it ever since my father bought it from my mother. I've always sort of said I would like that but one day. And then when obviously it came to me, I was really, really pleased to have it. And we love it. I think it's so extraordinary. Well, I think you're very lucky. There Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And enjoy it. I'll touch you for luck. Yeah. Oh, it's a nice thing. Thank you. Now, it's a strange thing about the road show. Some days we never see the same thing. Some days the same thing occurs again and again. This is the second wonderful cornet we've seen today, can you believe it? Now, curiously, all my life I've wanted to play the cornet. I've never, I'm completely unmusical, I'll never do it, but it's always been the instrument I particularly loved. So, why have you got this one? Well, that belonged to my husband. He played in a colliery band. Ah, in this area? In the Wakefield area, yes. Uh, right. I think he bought it a few years after he started playing, but mm. I can't remember when. Right. But it was an echo corn, it yes. he always wanted yes. one. Now, this is the interesting thing about it, um, because this is a very unusual instrument in the sense that most cornets, obviously, as most trumpets, have three valves. Yes. Now, this has got a fourth valve, and that allows sound to pass through an extra tube extension here yes. um, into this extraordinary sort of shaped extension which funnily enough almost looks like a sort of motorcycle exhaust yes. pipe doesn't yes. it now when listening to brass bands i've often heard when the cornets are playing there is this wonderful sort of echo behind the note and i've never known how it was made because i haven't seen one of these mm -hmm. seeing one i can understand it completely that you get that extra effect on top of your your main fingering yes. through the fourth valve it was made in London by a company called Besson. Um, we've got the box here, and you can see there's their label, and made in about 1900. So it was quite an old instrument when he bought it. Oh, was it? An instrument like this, in this condition, with all the box, by Besson, should be 800 to 1,000 pounds. Really? Yeah. Oh. Now, I just kept it because it, it was his. You kept it, for exactly, which is the mm. best reason for keeping it. It's a memory of him, and uh, to me, it's a memory of, of colliery bands, which, yes, of course, are nearly yes. a thing of the past. Yes, they are now, yes. I would describe this as a sort of um, sideboard vitrine. Uh, have, what else have you got? That, that... Uh, we've got what we call a dessert, or chiffonnière, which is much smaller, but it goes with this. I yes. see. Now, I would have said that this was a French piece. It yes. is, yes. It is a majorelle, and it was bought the last year of the war in an auction room in a little town in the Massif Central oh. by my parents, among other things. Ah, oh, right. Now, majorelle, majorelle is a, a magic name, really. 
Um, Majorelle associated particularly with the, the great period of French Art Nouveau furniture, uh, who came to real prominence, I suppose, at the 1900 exhibition, with very flamboyant, uh, curvy linear work and lots of marquetry and lots of gilt bronze. And in a way, one could say, well, this doesn't have a lot of those features. There is, in fact, a mark which says Majorelle Nancy down here. And he didn't sign all his pieces, but the, the better quality pieces was usually signed. Um, I'd love these handles, I must say. Absolutely tremendous. These have got grapes on them, yes. too, I can see. And we've got uh, grapes carved into the wood in the middle there. Also a very Majorelle feature. But let's just have a look at the draw. The dovetails here, very tight, very evenly spaced, which suggests machine, machine dovetailing. Made, yes. And, oh, this is great, because at the back, I you hardly ever see this, but you can see the, the absolutely characteristic features of machine-cut dovetails with these scallops. Yeah. This suggests that it is indeed a machine-made piece, mm -hmm. even though it's of extremely high quality. The other thing that perhaps goes with your idea of it being Majorelle is the, is the use of this wrought iron work. And this is, to me, what really makes the piece of furniture. I think this is really fantastic. Uh, you've got vine leaves, grapes, uh, and behind it, a panel of, of glass, which sets the whole thing off. Lorraine, which is where Nancy is, where, mm -hmm. where Majorelle worked, uh, became very famous for its ironwork in the late 19th century. And Majorelle picked up and really exploited that. Ah. I think for an insurance value, you should be looking at around uh, £9,000. £9,000? Very good. That's the money. Wow. So I hope nice that surprise. comes as a, as a nice very, surprise. Very, very nice surprise, it's yes. A, it is a handsome piece, I must say. We love it very much. Good. Here we have a limited edition of uh, The Fairy Caravan, which was one of the later books uh, by Beatrix Potter. And she signed it inside here for Fred Satterthwaite and Metal, with kind regards from the author Beatrix Helis. Well, we all know that she was married to uh, William Helis, the solicitor, and in this later book she actually calls herself Beatrix Helis. So what is the connection with Fred Satterthwaite and uh, Beatrix Potter? Fred Satterthwaite was um, portrayed in the book as Metal, his dog, because Beatrix Potter always turned her characters from people that she knew. So she wrote about people, oh, but, that's but turned them into characters. Oh, that's extraordinary. And so Metal was his dog. Lovely, and lovely. And if I, I turn to this page here, because it is a picture of a smithy that's anyway, right. and in the middle, is that metal? That's metal. She's actually yes. drawn metal in that's the middle it. metal. That's metal. Oh, I think yes. that's a wonderful, yeah. wonderful story. Um, all his dogs were called metal. Um, what, all at the were, same time? No, they were Lakeland Terriers. They were all Lakeland Terriers? Yes, and uh, presumably when one passed away or whatever happened to them, they, the next one was called metal. Called metal. Very yes. convenient, very they convenient. I always remember their names. Well, that's absolutely lovely. Now, have you any idea of value? Um, not really, except that I do know he was offered five pounds for it a number of years, well, a lot of years ago. Really? Um, yes. Well, and that's he, amazing. And it was given to me, and he told me that if ever I was short of money, then I could sell it. Right. But, Are you short of money? Um, well, I could be. <laughs> <laughs> Well, would it surprise you to know that this is worth five thousand pounds? Gosh, <laughs> a bit better than five pounds. <laughs> I think I think so by a few thousand. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for Thank bringing you. these in. It's a lovely story. Thank you. That's wonderful. Well, I trained as a needlework teacher, and when we were living in Surrey, my husband had this bright idea to start a needlework collection. So, being in London, we had the opportunity to go and buy things. Fantastic. Now, you bought this a long time ago? Uh, about 17 years, yes, I think so. Well, I know that it came, because it says so, from the, um, the Shepherd collection, which was the collection in, I think, 1982, something like that. And it's the most wonderful piece of mahogany. It is known as a Niddy Noddy. Right. And it is for measuring skeins of wool. 
and it's um, highly collectible, early 19th century, and probably worth as much as £300. <laughs> but it's a bit of stick. <laughs> no, it's not. It's turned. Wow. It's specially made. I don't know what to take out next. <laughs> well, I certainly haven't ever seen one of these. I've seen lots of needlework dolls with pins and everything else. I've never seen one with all its limbs made of what you see. This was probably made in Germany, this actual doll, and sent over here. And that again, for a needlework collector, I suppose we're talking about 60, 80 pounds, something wow. like that. And <laughs> this is known as a goose wing, and it actually is an early 19th century fruit wood knitting sheath. In here, you've got a knit knitting needle you put in, and you go around the house knitting with one, with one hand while you do your chores, and it's known as a goose wing, and it is highly collectible. We're talking about somewhere around 150 for that. No, 150? Fantastic. I like, this. I like this one. This is oh, look at that. Look at that with the original little mirrored in yes. interior. Tiny little scissors. Beautiful. Wonderful. Lovely little box, leather. We're talking about possibly the first half of the 19th yeah. century. Again, up to £100 for that. Wow. Some Tunbridge wear. That's my favourite. Is it? Yes, is it? Now, why is it your favourite? Well, I know they're quite rare. These were for holding narrow spools of thread. It's absolutely wonderful. That's a lovely, lovely piece, and it's in very good condition. Um, I would say that's probably worth about 200 on its own. Wow. Yeah. So, one more little doll here, which, again, they're collectible, probably 1890, something oh, like that. Exciting. I suppose, again, nearly 80 pounds or so for that. So, wow. what have we got here? We've got getting on for a couple of thousand pounds. Oh, wonderful collection. Just there. Yeah. Absolutely splendid. Wow. Well, Selby has certainly dug deep, but of all the materials and all the objects on offer, I think that wood has definitely been the star of the day. There was that imposing French sideboard, that lovely marquetry table, and these excellent Thomas Strudwick walking sticks made from the beams of the abbey. And you can't get closer to the heart of a place than that. So to the people of Selby, thank you very much for a warm welcome. Goodbye.